Well, people have been complaining, saying I upload too much to Flower Kings. And guess what? Today I'm going to end it. Unless, of course, they decide that they're going to release a limited edition of the album that has been released uh, last Friday. Waiting for Miracles, and by the way, if you're wondering, this is probably the second last video. I'm going to have to do a Waiting for Miracles review, and I'm going to have to talk about that. And, but, other than that, I have a definitive list. The Flower Kings. Yes, I know, I've done this before, and I watched that video, and I disagree with my list. So I went back, and I took a few months to go ahead and polish up this list. I hate my list from back then. It's bad, and it doesn't fit what I was actually thinking. Because I didn't actually listen to all of the album enough. I didn't listen to all of their albums enough. But now, I've listened to all of them at least 10 to 15 times. So I'm sure I have a definitive list. This is what I'm going to stick with until uh, probably a couple of years from now. <laughs> because this is pretty much, and I'm almost 100% certain, this is going to be my final list for this band. Now, I know I'm rambling, and there's a good reason for that. Because, you see, this is the final video of this. <laughs> this is not the final worst to best. I have like 10 others lined up and ready to go. But I have to finish finish the 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 listing. So this has the definitive this is the definitive list because I put everything that was labeled as the Flower Kings or can be labeled as the Flower Kings album on this list. I added Manifesto of an Alchemist, Roy Stoltz solo album named after uh, it was Roin Stoltz, The Flower Kings, so that's on this list, and also Roin Stoltz, The Flower King, released in 1994 before Back in the World of Adventures, so here we are, and I'm doing this now. Now, I've added both of these, and I've added the new album, which, by the way, I've listened to a bunch, and I'm going to have it on this list, so we got a full list until a limited edition of the new one comes out, or the next album, which... Is, which is probably going to be coming out next year, let's be honest. So, let's get into it. Number 15. <laughs> Manifesto of an Alchemist, released in 2018. <sighs> okay. First of all, this album is... Oh, I can't... I can't stand this album. I actually... I don't understand... Why, oh man, I really don't stand, I can't stand this album. It's all blues rock. There's no real progressive rock elements, and there's no catchy songs. And there's nothing technically hard to play on this album, and it doesn't contain any of the intoxicating atmospheres that the Flower Kings have perfected and Flower Kings fans are drawn to. Oh man, let's just move on. Number 14. Adam and Eve released in 2004. Gee, wow. Okay. I've changed my mind. See, I've changed my mind. Adam and Eve. There are only two saving graces on this album. Love Supreme, which is, I gotta say, really great. It's a really great song in Cosmic Circus. Those two are brilliant songs. All the rest of them I just cannot listen to. The... Oh. All bland and uninspiring, all blues rock, and, and nothing stands out all that much. So let's just move on to number 13 before I start ranting. <laughs> the Rainmaker, released in 2001. Now, this album has definitely grown on me. The reason why it is still super low is because of those, sta those tracks that I just cannot stand. Sort of God. I just cannot stand that song at all. It's blues for the sake of blues, and it's just not... It doesn't click with me. Now, anyone who likes Unfold the Future and Back, they will understand why I put this so low. And this one is usually at the bottom, but the only reason why it's above Adam and Eve now is because 
there are so many good songs on this album. Um, for oh man, um, Elaine, um, uh, Blessing of a Smile, uh, the opening track. The remaker is pretty decent. It's okay. It's fine. It's fine. It's okay. Um, oh Jesus, City of Angels is a brilliant track, and uh, Serious Dreamers. That's a really good one too. But uh, it's the only the only reason why I kept it at number th- at near the bottom is because of those songs that I just cannot stand. Even then, I mean, this album is great. The, the Flower Kings have not released a bad album so far. And I mean, you've got close, but it's still a decent album and it has some really great tracks. So let's move on to number twelve. The tide. Banks of Eden released in 2012. Now, this one introduces their new drummer. I think his name is Felix Lehmann. He's a German drummer, right? If I'm not mistaken, that's his name. Um, Now, this album starts off with a really strong 25-minute concept piece or or epic um, numbers being very dark and out of character, which is nice. But it's it has a little bit of the blues rock side that I'm not attracted to. And it, it is technically good. And it has those really fantastic moments that are just like, oh, man, that is classic Flower Kings right there. Um, but other than that, it's just more blues rock. Rising the Imperial is one of my favorite songs on this album. Um, prob- it probably is my favorite song on this album. Because it's a really great song, no blues rock. It's it's a darker take on the Flower King sound, which I really did like on Banks of Eden. So, number 11. <laughs> Retropolis, released in 1996. Oh man, it really hurt to put this one so low, but it really had to be done. It's an outstanding second album to be released. But it is very simple. It has really good solos by both Thomas and Roy. And you know what? For the most part, it doesn't share the same complexity as um, the previous album or the albums going forward. Um, it's still a good album, and I think that it's a fantastic album. I just said the same thing twice. <laughs> Songwriting is good, but it just has a technical issue, and it has a sound problem, too. It's just not as moody or atmospheric as um, some of the next albums that we'll be talking about. So, let's go. Let's keep it going. Number 10. I'm not just when the end is near. Desolation Rose, released in 2013. This one's different. This one's not as dark as Banks of Eden, but it's still pretty dark. And it has a little bit of the blues stuff that I'm not a huge fan of. But the bonus disc has some very interesting tar- tracks with a lot of obvious nods to their favorite bands. Um, Interstellar Visitations is a very Lamb Lies Down song with nods to Genesis and Pink Floyd. And Tower One is a fantastic song, very quintessential, with, again, very obvious nods to um, probably mid seventies Genesis, which I love. That is, and it has some very yes characteristics too. So that's on the top of my book, right there. That's a very that's a go to track if you want to listen to uh, some Flower Kings. Tower One is a is a must listen to. Let's carry on. Number nine, The Flower King, released in nineteen ninety four. Oh, man. People are going to rip me apart for this. Um, as an album that many find as a, an actual Flower Kings album, this album is fantastic. A tad on the amateur shy, side, shy, <laughs> um, but it shows where the band's going to lead. So, um, Scanning the Greenhouse, which, by the way, is the name of the compilation album, that's a really interesting, really quirky track. However, here's the thing. The only reason why I put it at 9 is because it doesn't have Thomas Bodine, and it only has Roy Stoll as the keyboard player. He's not all that great, which is not good. He's a fantastic guitar player. I give him so much respect for his guitar playing ability, but his keyboard playing 
is subpar. I love you, Roin. I really do. You're an inspiration to me, but no keyboards. <laughs> um, thankfully, this album, it's really great. It has great songwriting. It is amateurish, and it lacks the atmospheres that the Flower Kings has been known for producing. So, number eight. <laughs> Paradox Hotel, released in 2006. This is a great album. Only really weak song on this album is Monsters and Men, and that's still a good song. It's just... It's the 20-minute concept piece that starts off the album. It's a 20-minute epic. And it's just... I hate to say it. The lyrics are great. But... In terms of songwriting, it's just, it feels like they're trying to go with that quieter side of things, and it doesn't really work here. They've done it on on uh, other epics, but this one just didn't fit. It had some blues rocking moments, and it wasn't very technically good. It wasn't precise. It wasn't fantastic. Um... Another huge falter on this album is the song Paradox Hotel. It, it's it's a conflicting song for me because it's a back and forth thing. I either love it or I hate it. It's one of those songs because it's either very catchy for me or it's really bad. And it, it just, it keeps on, it, it's fitting, but it's either a good or bad song at times. I still love this album and it really does hurt me to, Put this album at number eight. Oh, and great songs on this album. Ones that are must listens. What if God is alone? Fantastic song. And hit me with a hit. Those ones are obvious wins for me. Fantastic songs. Amazing. So number seven. Back in the world of adventures, released in 1995. Oh boy! <laughs> oh man, I put this at seven. It really hurts to put me put this one this low too. Oh man, I can't. Oh well, this is a really great debut album. It flows well, great songwriting, and it has a really thick, really um, intoxicating atmosphere. It is. It suffers from the same thing the Flower King did. Um, and it has very amateurish qualities. It shows a, It does show, again, where the band will end up. The mix is really good, and the instrumentation is really good. Playing, in other words. Um, as painful it is, as it is for me to put this low, it has those bad songs that show growing pains on this album, like Go West Judas, which is still a good song, but it, it really does show the growing pains on this album. Um, and besides, I mean, I like the albums after this one just a tad better. Number six. Burning like fever. Waiting for Miracles, released this year. This is, oh man, I did not expect this album to almost reach the top five. It wavered back and forth between five and six for, for a bit. Um, and in fact, Back in the World of Adventures was at number five, and that's the weirdest thing, but this one almost stayed at number six for this entire thing. The only reason why I didn't put it at number five is because of the mix. This album is really technical, it's strong, it's a fantastic release, but the mix is bad. It's a very guitar-oriented mix. There, you can barely hear the keyboards in some of the in some moments of this album, which is not how the keyboards usually sound in a Flower Kings album. Usually, it's a 50-50. Even in Back in the World of Adventures, it was maybe 60-40, but still, I mean, you could still hear them. This is 80-20, maybe. That's probably as bad as I can give it. But I love the songs on this album. Man, Sleep with the Enemy is, it's either my first favorite or it's my second favorite. Um, um, if it's not Sleep with the Enemy, then it's, God, it, it has to be, it, it has to be, um, We Were Always Here. That is a brilliant, very Stardust We Are sounding track, which I love, 
It's great. It's it's very retro. It's exactly what they were trying to do, and that's exactly what they were saying that they were going to do with this album. They accomplished that. They accomplished the sound, and oh, it's great. It's really great. It's technical. It's real prog. There's almost no blues rock songs on this album. There's blues rock elements like guitar solos that sound blues rocking, but it's still really good. I'm doing a lot of hand gestures. <laughs> um... But, uh, one thing is, is that Thomas Bodine is, Thomas Bodine's departure is definitely felt on this album, and that's why I couldn't put it in the top five. And besides, the next album's slightly better anyway. So, number five. Play that song just one more time. The Sum of No Evil, released in 2007. <laughs> why did I put this at number 11 on my original? I don't know. Maybe because I didn't listen to it enough. I don't know. This album is seriously a top five Flower Kings album from end to end. It's just a brilliant album. And it's... Oh, I seriously can't get enough of this album. It's its probably the most technical album they've ever released. Um... It ha it's a f like I said, it's a fantastic album from end to end. There is full, it's there's tasteful, crunchy guitars, a very good mix, an extremely intricate and technical keyboard and guitar solos, and playing, of course. Everything on this album is just really, really great. Of course, uh, one more time, great song, the sum of no reason, underrated, severely underrated at that. Um. <sighs> Uh, Love is the only answer. Flight 999, uh, Brimstone Air. Brilliant. I <laughs> still have no idea why it's called that. But Thomas, you wrote a great song. Um, Life in Motion, great one. Even the bonus disc on the limited edition with uh, Regal Divers and Turn to Stone. Brilliant. Brilliant. It, this album is just great. I love this album. It's great. It's grown on me considerably, and it's a very, very quintessential Flower Kings album that everyone should listen to if you love this band. Go listen to it. Give it a second try. Seriously, this album is fantastic. Number four. Sweet the killing floor, yelling, man on the Unfold the Future, released in 2002. I really can't get enough of this album. The Truth Will Set You Free from Start to Finish is just an amazing piece. And I do have the remix and remaster, the 2017 reissue, and it's just a fan... It's, it's, it's great, and the remaster quality just gives this album more light, and it's just much better sound. Um, of course, it has those incredibly great epics, short bangers, and those shorter epics that are around 8 to 15 minutes long. And it manages to keep itself interesting throughout. A few blues rock elements here and there, but it's pretty tasteful. So, I really can't hate this album because, oh man, I really love this album. It's so good. The entirety of, Unf uh, of Unfold the Future is a great album. Of course, it couldn't make the top three, because this one's number three. Space Revolver, released in 2000. Even after listening to the bonus disc on the Japan... The, the Japan... <laughs> the, the Japan edition, this album had to stay at third. I, I felt so bad. It was wavering back and forth. Like Waiting for Miracles. It went back and forth between 5th and 6th. Um, <sighs> everything on that bonus disc is fantastic. And Dream on Dreamer, the alternative take. Holy crap. Thomas, you should have done a lot more stuff, man. Your voice is awesome. I really don't have to explain this album. I love this album. It's brilliant to end to from end to end as well. 
I Am The Sun Part 1 and closing with I Am The Sun Part 2. Brilliant structure. Um, uh, the uh, King's Prayer, fantastic. Oh, man, I really can't get enough of this album. It's just brilliant. Technical, it had some very interesting jazz, blues, and then classical moments that just blow your mind away. But, of course... Number two did it better, so let's talk about number two. Flower Power, released in 1999. Oh, man, the epics, the long songs, and the short masterpieces. Quiet and loud moments. Gregorian chants, jazzy moments. Ah, my list was fading. Uh, Classical pieces, fast solos, this album has it all. Even the, the... the tasteful blues rock songs work on this album. But it has two songs that don't work very well, which are uh, Deaf, Numb, and Blind and Stupid Girl, which are just blues rock songs that don't actually work on this album. Of course, the bonus discs... Don't, don't bonus discs? The bonus disc has those two songs that just don't fit and would end up on a worse album, such as The Rainmaker. Ha ha ha! Oh, well, whatever. It's okay. Still love this album. And, of course... Oh, man. Magic Pie is fantastic. That is a great song. Eight minutes long. Written by Hass- Hass- Freuberg. So that's interesting. Also, that entirety of Garden of Dreams was written by Thomas Bodine and Stolt. So, there you go. Boom. Mind blown. If you already know what number one is, and you've already watched my previous one, then you already know what number one is. So, let's just get it out of the way, and I'll just ramble about it. So, number one. I'm just a clown in the eyes of the world. Stardust We Are, released in 1997. This album is still incredible. <laughs> Not one bad song. Everything works. It's qui- the quiet instrumental pieces, soft rocking moments, quirky moments, jazz bits, soft guitars, and of course, the little track. Little. <laughs> the title track of Stardust We Are that closes the album. Just an absolutely eth- ethereal and astonishing track. And. <sighs> It just works. Everything on this album is pieced together. Nothing is out of place, no filler, and it all just pieces together in a beautiful way. Many of those pieces that pe- the the Flower Kings community would consider fillers, such as Poor Mr. Rain's Ordinary Guitar, Pipes of Peace, If 28, and Hotel Nirvana, are just ethereal tracks as the title track, and it uses some of the same chords, and well, Pipes of Peace and If Twenty One, If Twenty Eight do use those uh, same chords as the title track, so you know that's true. In the Hotel Nirvana, I don't care what people say, that song is an atmospheric masterpiece that just is so Genesis, so Pink Floyd, and so yes, in one, in one, in a um, two-minute song, it's brilliant. This is proof that the Flower Kings nailed their career in the beginning. And this, in my opinion, is why the Flower Kings should be in the top 10 greatest progressive rock bands of all time. But we'll get into that later with my top 10 favorite progressive rock bands of all time. Coming sometime short, shortly. <claps> Woohoo! Let's do that later. Oh, man. So hopefully you guys like this list. If you didn't, I'm sorry, but this is my opinion. <laughs> that was very defensive. I'm sorry. Thank you guys so much for watching. My neck just cracked. Thank you guys so much for watching. And peace.